Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Jack Jackson's, uh, I guess it's called the Com Comanche Moon Saga, but it was published as three comics in from 77 and 78. White Comanche, Red Raider, and Blood on the Moon. Um, Jack Jackson, uh, one of the greats of underground comics, uh, did all, a lot of the typical stuff underground cartoonists did. You know, he uh, did like slow death science fiction stuff, um, horror stuff for Skull, very adult. He was more that kind of underground cartoonist. Uh, the guys who revered EC Comics wanted to bring back that. But then in the... Uh, he had this love of history, and basically from this point on, the majority of Jack Jackson's comic work has been historical novels, historical comics. He uh, just loves research and stuff. Uh, he's a Texan, so he loves Texas history. Um, many of his uh, stories are based on Texas history, uh, this one included. Um, this is some amazing stuff. Uh, Jack Jackson, I have nothing but admiration for it. I've always loved his shit in Undergrounds when he was telling gnarly horror stories. But this is like a whole other thing, especially back then. You know, now it's kind of common for people to put out graphic novels of historical things and, and they sell at libraries or, or I mean, they sell them to libraries. But he was doing this for an underground publisher. And it's kind of amazing that Last Gas put these out, you know, they were probably like, I don't know who's going to buy these. Most people buy underground comics to read about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And he just does this straight history comic, and it's it's amazing. So uh, let's look at the first one here. White Comanche. The true story of Cynthia Ann Parker and her life with the wild Comanches of Texas. I like this how Jack Jackson makes the Last Gasp logo. Gives it like a Western feel, a Texan feel. Beautiful Jack Jackson art. Right? This is kind of nice, just seeing a map of where all the tribes were in Texas, all the Comanche tribes, because there's many different Comanche tribes. There's a Deguero type of uh, Cynthia Ann Parker from 1862. Little introduction by a historian. And here we see, uh, spring 1836, Texas is in turmoil. Uh, the Comanches are on the warpath. They're uh, really pissed off at these white settlers who just keep fucking shit up. So uh, they attack this fort and they kill almost everyone inside. We see Lucy Parker attempting to escape with her uh, four children. The Comanches show up, though, and they grab Cynthia. <laughs> she looks kind of funny there. Kind of looks like an old lady with a tiny body. And uh, Lucy escapes with two of her children, the two sons. Another son is taken by the Comanches and brought somewhere else. And Cynthia is taken to this one particular tribe. Just, uh, I hope you're noticing this beautiful art. Like, Jack Jackson put so much work into this. Just the amount of line work. Look at this. The shading on these, every log of this fort. Um, he uses airbrush. Uh, not airbrush, I'm sorry. Uh, he uses, uh, like, craft tint and zip -a tone throughout for shading. He just really put his heart and soul into this, and you can tell. It's really nice art. So, Cynthia's adopted into this tribe. Uh, one of the Comanche tribes. Uh, the grown women, they just horribly rape right in front of Cynthia. She's got to hear their cries. But once she's adopted into the tribe, um, they have like a little hazing initiation. But they accept her and they're pretty nice to her. It's not like they treat her like a little slave. This this couple who lost their child, a very old couple, they adopt her. And they're happy, you know, they love her like a daughter. They rename her Nadua, White Comanche. Nadua was the name of their dead daughter. In 
And she learns all the ways of the Comanche. At least the, the woman's work. And she picks it up very quickly. They're all kind of impressed what a smart little girl she is. And she loves her life. You know, she pretty much forgets her old life after a few years. She loves her adopted parents. She loves living in nature. She grows up to be a very beautiful woman. One day, this uh, other Comanche tribe comes to visit and their leader, uh, Peta Nakona, let's just call him Peta. He uh, takes a liking to Catherine and she kind of thinks he's pretty some, something special too. So he makes an offer to the parents and uh, he gets to marry her. I like how the dialogue in this is kind of um, colloquial. Is I, I don't know if that's the word, maybe anachronistic, but I mean, they're adapting the Indian's language, the Comanche's language. So, or translating it, I should say. So, you know, I mean, I'm sure in the vernacular, they, it sounded, you know, casual. There's another one that got away, girls. Shh. And we see their life together. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, white cavalry guys will come and they'll recognize. They'll be like, that must be that Cynthia Ann Parker girl. Because everyone's looking for her for all this time. There's posters up. Because, I mean, just the fact that these Comanches kidnapped her. You know, it's a horrible scandal. So she gives a birth to a son named Kwana, the firstborn. And pretty soon she has a an, another brother. I'm sorry, another son and another daughter. <laughs> like this baby and his papoose. I don't know if you can see it, but he kind of looks like Uncle Fester. <laughs> this big chubby face. I like too how Jack Jackson puts a lot of humor in here. You know, he's an underground cartoonist. He can't help it. Some of the guys will be very caricatured and kind of silly looking. And they'll, they'll be saying funny stuff to each other. So, um, Kwana meets his grandfather, Peta Nakona's dad. And he teaches them a lot of great stuff about hunting buffalo, about, you know, being a warrior. And he's, uh, he's known as Iron Shirt. Because uh, he actually has a suit of armor and everyone thinks he's invulnerable because arrows just bounce off it. So uh, Quan is a loving being a Comanche too, just like his mom. I mean, he never knew any other way. So of course the backdrop of this is all the encroaching white settlers and the... the um, the army and the Indians way of life is dwindling, but they're still pretty strong on this first issue here. But every day, you know, every month there's more encroachment, more tribes go off to reservations. See, there's like the airbrush. I'm sorry, I said it again, like zip a tone. He's really a, uh, Though actually, now that I look at it, that's very uneven, almost as if he did that by hand. He just did pointillist, pointillism. So finally, the um, one of the army guys, uh, he's like, you got to get that Quana guy. That's his mission. Because Quana has become a really great leader and has been raiding the white settlers very successfully. So they kill a guy that they think is Quana. And... Uh, they find uh, Catherine 
and they take her back to civilization, quote unquote civilization, because uh, they recognize her. They're like, that must be that Catherine Ann Parker. And after he, she's taken away, her husband cuts off his hair. He kind of loses the will to live. He's just heartbroken. And pretty soon after he dies. So Cynthia Ann's second captivity, because it is, she doesn't want to leave. She, she loves her life. But of course, these guys are like, oh, we're rescuing you from these savages. She still has relatives, uh, the Parkers. Are, so they take her to the Parkers. You know, she has cousins, she has brothers, uncles, and she can't really fit in. <laughs> she, this is her mourning thing. She slashes her chest with a knife. You can imagine her her relatives are just like, what the fuck are you doing? But everyone's pretty nice to her. They even give her a stipend to Texas Congress to help her get back on her feet. And it's not like her life is that bad here. Everyone's uh, amazed at uh, just how, what a great worker she is. She contributes so much because the Comanches taught her all this great, you know, good knowledge. But she misses her husband and kids so much, she won't eat. She basically starves herself to death. She's so heartbroken. And uh, she dies. And we see Quana thinking about his mom, saying, I wonder where you are now. And that's how it ends. And it basically gives us a teaser that the next one's gonna be all about Quana. The Texas legend, who was the last chief of the Comanches. Little coming attractions of the next two, even though they're a little out of order. Just really nice art, though. I don't know if these are even in the comics. He totally gives credits and references. Look how much research he did. I mean, he, he thinks all these history centers and libraries that he visited. So he really put work into this. Nice back cover there. Okay, the next one, Red Raider. Young Quanah Parker and the Texas Comanches during the turbulent Civil War years. Beautiful co cover. This one's also 77. We see a little prologue, tells us what's gone before. Vision Seeker. So young Quana, uh, you know, his father's dead, his mother's gone. He's kind of adopted by these other Comanches. He's got to kind of, he's got to prove himself. Because he had such a famous father, he's kind of in a weird situation. A lot of people see him as maybe a potential threat to, to their power. But mostly people are like, oh, you know, we, we like this kid. His dad was a great warrior. We're going to treat him good. And he realizes it's time for his vision quest. So he goes out to the desert, he fasts in a smoke lodge, goes out to the desert, you know, obviously fasts some more, he's not eating anything, and no vision's coming. He smokes tobacco, but then finally, he's so delirious, I imagine that's why he has a vision. And then this Jack Jackson gets to use his underground skills <laughs> to run psychedelic crazy shit. But this is some beautifully drawn stuff. This winged white buffalo visits him and he gives him a message. All of a sudden a lightning bolt hits it and it starts to desiccate instantly. Maggot, inf it turns into a maggot infested carcass. But then uh, Quana realizes that the flies turn into bees and it's actually a giant honeycomb. And the white buffalo reappears and says, taste it, you know. That what seems to be rotten and putrid is sweet like honey for those who dare to taste. So that's the kind of wisdom he gives them. Very, you know, trippy stuff it's from a spirit animal. If they ever make a movie of this, they got to get Johnny, someone who sounds like Johnny Cash to be the voice of the white buffalo. Quana. So he returns exhilarated, renewed in spirit. He's had his vision. 
he feels invulnerable now because uh, he uh, makes a, a shield with the white buffalo on it. And this will protect him in battle. Everyone thinks he had a really good vision. Everyone's very impressed with it. So Quan is a young warrior and he starts proving himself. You know, first just starting off small, stealing a horse or two there from a settler. But he, apparently he's got a knack, at, knack for this. And uh, he does more and more daring stuff. Attacking soldiers. Uh, I'm sorry, American soldiers, I should say. I like that the art is lightened up a little. I mean, I love that dense, beautiful art, but it's almost like the printing, the paper couldn't handle it. Uh, it was almost a little too muddy. I think he realized what the printing press could do. So uh, this woman in the tribe takes a like an iguana. And he, once again, we see Jack Jackson's underground talents. <laughs> he draws this woman like completely, like a chambiadora or something, you know, just insanely art crumb-like. But um, she, this this woman who she really likes Kwana too, you know, they're pretty much in love. She's already been promised to this other guy, this spoiled rich kid, basically. And so he basically goes off to steal some horses because uh, in the to the Comanches, uh, that was like the greatest form of currency: is ponies and horses. So if you wanted to marry a woman, you'd give the father, you know, as many horses as you could afford, like the dowry. And he's poor, Quana. But Quana's like, I, I know how to get horses. I'll get as many as I need. So he goes off on this raid. Yeah, once again, just beautiful shading here. The nighttime, uh, the gray tone, wash tone. Really nice. So they decide to elope. And the spoiled kid basically comes for satisfaction. And Quana makes a deal with him. He just says like, dude, you don't even love this girl. This here, she was 19 horses. And the thing settled. Everything's okay. He made good. His new father-in-law says, actually, we wanted you anyway as a son, son-in-law, you know. We liked you a lot better than that turd. So during the Civil War, the, you know, America's a little preoccupied, pulling in troops from the West to fight the war between the states. So uh, the Comanches are just like, let's go crazy. And uh, they just start raiding everywhere. Every time you turn around, the Comanches are stealing someone's cattle or horses. And uh, Quan is totally into this. Quan is very much like, you know, fuck the white man. We gotta destroy all of these guys. They're just ruining our way of life. Which they were. And of course, the the generals want to make treaties with them. Man, there's some really beautiful art here. I love the way he draws that guy. And it's kind of sad. A lot of the elders of these tribes sign up these bullshit treaties. That of course the the uh, the white men are gonna rip them off, and they do. And the story continues on the back cover here. Kind of makes me sad this wasn't in color. It's not like Jack Jackson's a master of color. You could tell like he's he's learning. But this looks pretty nice. I would love to read the whole comic in this format. So it basically ends where Quan is just like, yeah, fuck those guys who signed the treaty. Well, I'm not going to go on a reservation. You know, I want to live as a Comanche the right way. So if, if I have to kill every white man and do it, I'll do it. And he's uh, going to be kind of a hero of the Comanches, as we shall see in this final 
chapter, well, for now, uh, Blood on the Moon, 1978. There's a wraparound I guess I should show you. Pretty nice. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need some water. So yeah, Quan is on the warpath. He's just killing every white person he can find, every settler, trapper. Takes on many wives. His prestige is definitely growing. He's kind of like a sub chief. I think he has, uh, or oh, just has several wives. So he's got a bunch of wives. <clears throat> Here's more and more distressing news about how the Indians are being treated on the reservations. And he tries to recruit more of the Comanches to join him, to push the white man out. No compromise. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the Buffalo soldiers are sent out to get the Comanches. And so the Bureau of Indian Affairs has already set up, you know, these reservations. A lot of the Indians go on these reservations, but then they sneak out and do raids. Yes, because they're like, yeah, times are tough. The reservation will at least give us food and like crappy little houses, huts. But we still want to live the way we have always lived. Like uh, Comanche warriors. So, of course, the the director of the Indian Affairs is kind of feeling like a like a fool. He's like, ah, my, my red children are deceiving me, showing how patronizing he is. General Sherman, uh, the Southern, uh, the Civil War uh, general of the South, he comes out to assess the situation. So yeah, in this issue, we totally see like just the Comanche's got nowhere left to run. Uh, the army is totally either putting them in jail, putting them on the reservations, you know, taking their guns, throwing them on the reservation where they can't do any harm to white folk. But they're killing all the buffalo. That's the main thing. You know, all those buffalo hunters were just, they would just hire them to kill as many buffalo as they could. And they massacred the buff buffalo in like s really short time. It was like within 20 years, people could, you could see the difference. There's like millions of buffalo stampeding across the prairies and deserts. And then pretty soon there was none. They were almost all dead. So the Indians are very desperate. And but Kwana and his uh, tribe are still free. They're one of the few ones who are still like fighting the army, the American army. And unfortunately, the American army sends this guy Mackenzie. He's a smart young officer, and you know he kind of got his ass kicked the first time out by Kwana, but he learned his lessons, and. Uh, he becomes more and more effective in uh, zeroing in on Quana. Here's the Buffalo War. Yeah, so this is what the it looks like now. Just Buffalo uh, skeletons everywhere. The Buffalo Hunters would, uh, they had these high-powered rifles. They would just sit there and just kill like hundreds of Buffaloes a day. And a lot of people think that got, you know, defeated the Comanches more than any army maneuver. There was just no more, they lived off buffalo. That was their lifeblood, you know. So that they killed all the buffalo, you know, pretty soon after they were, they were gonna die. And they had to go crawl into the reservations, you know, to beg for something, beg for food. 
So Quan is, you know, riling up his people. Some of the elders are trying to say, hey, I don't know about this. Calm down. Maybe we shouldn't go to war. But people really respect Kwana, so it looks like uh, he's got a pretty big war party. Now, just every panel on this is pretty spectacular. He's not slacking on the amount of detail he puts in. So they attack Mackenzie's fort. Oh, I'm sorry. This is another fort. These are civilians. And so they, they're defeated at this place. And it's, it's not looking good for the Comanches. You know, they still kill, like, if it's, someone's out there alone on the prairie, they'll kill any white man, but they just don't have the force anymore to attack the army head on. So Mackenzie's basically on his like final solution. He's like, gets all these reinforcements and it's like, we're gonna take care of these Comanches one for, once and for all. We're gonna, he has like five divisions and they're all gonna come in from every direction. And they find the Comanches due to these, uh, one of the scouts. Uh, well, I'm sorry, this guy, a Comanchero. He uh, squeals on them. They're going to kill him. So he says, I'll tell you where they are. They're in this valley. And the American army totally gets the drop on them. And they burn everything, all their food. They shoot all the horses. Because Quana and a lot of his people escaped this massacre. But, you know, all their shit's gone. And it's winter's coming. Yeah, here's the scene where they're killing the horses. I like how he shows the soldiers what they're thinking. They're like, God, I hate this. Damn waste of good horse flesh. Because back then, you know, especially the Comanches, they called, they called horses the... Uh, god dogs <laughs> they were like they just thought they were like divine creatures they even have sayings like basically a Comanche without a horse is not a Comanche like they just relied on them so much so finally Quan is you know leading these people through the desert they're starving and Quan gives in and he goes to the local reservation Throws all his weapons, they throw all their weapons in a pile, even his shield with the white buffalo on it. And he uh, surrenders. They put him in these crappy tents. And of course, Quan is miserable and all his people are miserable. There's no way to live, you know, just sitting around. No hunting, no raiding. So they kind of go easy on him. Because he was the one chief who never signed a treaty. So they're basically saying he hasn't broken a treaty then. And they even, like, it's weird that these white guys are kind of defending him, saying, yeah, he killed, but in defense of his own territory, as a soldier of his people, and a very worthy one, I might add. So the whites really respect Kwana, and they kind of, you know, they don't um, treat him too badly. I mean, the whole thing's a bad setup, but... You know, they could have executed him for being, you know, the great enemy. So that's not the end of the story, though. So these are the three issues that came out in the 70s. There's no more stories about Quana until in 2003, they published a collection collecting all those three issues I just showed you. Plus, they added what happened to Quana after... You know, during his life of being uh, not free. I don't know why, but they got this kind of crappy, muddy painting. It's by uh, Sam Yeats. I wonder if that's Tom Yeats' brother. 
cartoonist. So this graphic novel is called Comanche Moon. That's why I just figured maybe that's what the whole, those three issues, you know, collectively are called. And it's kind of annoying. Um, you know, I didn't look through the whole thing, but they, I did notice they censored stuff. The scene I showed you where Quana first meets his wife in the pond and she's totally naked and buxom. And in the com this comic, they covered it up and I was like, oh, I'm so glad I have the originals. It just pisses me off when they censor shit like that. So the last, uh, I don't know, 20 or so pages of this book are what happened to Quana after he was penned up. They reprinted like a, the last few pages of what we just read. And, you know, Quana is disappointed with his surround, you know, his living situation. But he decides to do something about it. He says, if my mother could learn the ways of the Comanche, I can learn the ways of the white. So uh, he educates himself. He kind of hangs out with his uh, white relatives. try to learn the ways and basically uh his uncle the main thing he teaches him is like yeah you gotta learn about money that's that's what it's all about if you want to learn how to be a white man or at least know their ways also during this time um he discovers peyote and he becomes like a disciple of peyote almost like it's his religion So he's learning about white man civilization. And it seems like he navigates the world pretty well. Like he negotiates with the government, gets better benefits for uh, him and his people. And then even like, just becomes a really good businessman. He actually uh, has, he has a knack for it. He makes a lot of money. All the local businessmen around him, kind of big uh, businessmen, they all respect him, kind of friends with him. I like this craziness there. That looks like something from a, I don't know, like an old comic strip from like 1910. <laughs> it's Winsor McKay or something. Yeah, so Quana starts uh, dealing in cattle he kind of becomes the, like, what's the word for it? The chief judge of the, his tribe. He basically says, you know, we should have our own justice here on the reservation. You know, Indians should be tried by Indians. And uh, all these ranchers are driving their cattle through the Indian land that's promised to the Indians, to the Comanches. So he just basically says, um, hey, I'll charge you. Like a toll, a dollar per head of cattle. So he's just always good at like figuring out ways to make money. Here's him tripping out on peyote. And even though he's really good at navigating this white man world, he, uh, you know, he still doesn't really like it. But, you know, he's pretty friendly to everyone. He's got actually these friends, his colleagues, these white rich businessmen. They're kind of chummy. But even though he's he is this way, he also, you know, people keep saying like, oh, you got to accept Jesus Christ. He's like, no, this is my religion. I, you, you should do peyote, <laughs> you know. He's really impressed by white the white te man's technology. He sees that Deguero type of Cynthia Ann Parker that we saw at the beginning, beginning of the first comic. And he's just amazed. He's just like, it's like holding your spirit in a card. It just keeps to it better and better. Totally assimilates, even though it doesn't really. He likes, still is definitely a Comanche. But, you know, he dresses up when he has to, when he goes to court, put, knows how to put a suit on. He even becomes a sh deputy sheriff of Lawton, Oklahoma. Hey, he makes extra money by doing Wild West shows, who rounds up all the Comanches, because they still have the wanderlust in them. You know, they're a nomadic people. 
So anytime any state fair or Confederate veterans gathering or picnics, you know, he'll hire himself out. If they'll invite them like, hey, come on, she's coming, put on your show. So they love it because it gives them an excuse to get off the reservation. He actually kind of becomes chummy with Teddy Roosevelt. He even invites him to the inauguration. He wants Quana and uh, some of his Comanches to uh, march in the inaugural parade. And he has him up on the podium, you know. He even stumps for him. Quana stumps for Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, I'm sorry. He, he likes Teddy Roosevelt, but he actually is a Democrat. So, like, he doesn't change his tune. So he knows the score. He's like, yeah, the Republicans... They're for the rich man. I'm a Democrat because, you know, I wasn't always rich. And then finally, <clears throat> Kwana dies. Pretty good age, though. Seemed like he had a pretty comfortable life. But, you know, I don't think he was as happy as he would have been. And so ends the story of the last chief of the Comanches, Quana June Parker. I guess in the intervening years between the first comics in this book, they found another Deguero type of Cynthia Ann Parker. This is just two months after she was recaptured. Oh, this is amazing. Just seeing all these pictures. This is the Parker family. Uh, Cynthia Ann's uncle, her cousins. But this is great getting to see Quana. And that's his first wife, his show wife, as, as they're known. And we see them totally get older. They're a cute couple. And these are the many sides of Quana Parker. You know, dressed up in traditional Comanche gear. Dressed up as a in white man's clothes. I don't know what he's supposed to be here, like a a gypsy king. And these are uh, some of his kids. Pretty cute. It's interesting. The oldest one is named Weyote, but all the younger ones after him are just named Wanda, Harold, Lynn, and Baldwin. So I guess he was becoming a little, uh, you know assimilated so there you have it um i recommend you gotta own these first three this graphic novel you gotta own because it's got that last chapter and those photos are kind of interesting to see but uh just the fact that they censored this comic and who knows what else they censored you know i didn't flip through it that carefully but i did check that out i was like are they gonna have that nudity because that's the funny thing there's all this gore in the earth you know, the Indians torturing people and killing them. But, you know how America is. We don't give a shit about gore. There's one titty. You see one nipple. And everyone freaks out. So I think they were trying to sell this to the library market. And like, maybe even history, uh, college history uh, market. So there you have it. Jack Jackson, the master, the expert of Texas history, at least in the comic book field. Doing his amazing... Comanche Moon comic. Um, I hope you can find these. This is a central part of any com great comic book collection. At least I think so. And uh, so should so say we all. So thanks for watching. And uh, I hope you return here to the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.